Welcome back to the show. Today we have Ken Aldrich. He's a serial entrepreneur and seed stage investor. Ken, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you back on kind of the TV version of the show. You've done an incredible amount of stuff. Um, so maybe before we get into all that fun stuff, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Well, I grew up in Oklahoma. Um, okay. And uh, in Oklahoma City, and then went east to college for a total of eight years altogether. Seems like a lifetime. <laughs> what did you take? Uh, then, pardon me? What did you take? Well, I was a history and literature major at Harvard. Okay. And then I did a year of graduate work in Columbia and in a theological seminary, actually. And uh, then I went back to Harvard Law School. Okay. What made you want to take law? <laughs> pardon me? What made you want to take law? Well, the truth is it was kind of a default option. Uh, okay. I, uh, I had been groomed from childhood to be a, a Presbyterian preacher, realized while I was in graduate school that really wasn't for me, and uh, law was, uh, quite frankly, the only way I could be sure that I could make a living. So that's what I did. <laughs> sure. So you get out of law school, you've had a ton, a ton of experience. Do you maybe want to walk us through kind of your career, some career highlights, and then we'll kind of get into the dream toolbox? Absolutely. Yeah. Once I got out of law school, I practiced for about four and a half years. I wanted to be sure that I took advantage of the education I had and, and grounded it in actual practice, uh, but realized fairly early that I was really uh, much more interested in being on the other side of the table, starting businesses, running businesses, all of that aspect. So I evolved from that, left law practice, went to work briefly in an investment banking firm, setting up a real estate uh, finance operation for them. Uh, then that company, unfortunately, went bankrupt out from under me. <laughs> so I went to work for a client who was in the early stage of the real estate investment trust business. And unfortunately, that business also collapsed out from under me in about 1975. And I said, you know, I don't think I can do any worse than this. Two companies that I worked <laughs> for that I loved have both gone bankrupt. Let's see what I can do on my own. So I started out in the real estate business, buying and selling houses and then apartment buildings. And then ultimately, uh, ultimately with a couple of partners, we built a 30-story high rise wow. and uh, did that up through the... Uh, 86 Tax Act and uh, the financial crisis of 86, which changed all the rules of finance and leverage. Uh, it was a bizarre time because we built a hundred million dollar high rise office building. The most money either my partners or I ever had invested was a hundred thousand dollars. Wow. And we, we took three million dollars out with the first construction draw. After the 86 collapse of the SNL industry, you couldn't do that anymore. Sure. So I said, okay, where can I go so that I don't have to form a public fund, but I can still do deals that have the potential to have great returns? And the answer for me was, let's get into early stage venture capital, the, okay. the seed stage really, because I don't need a lot of capital, but if I make the right bet, it could be the next Google or something. Sure. Well, I never got Google, but I did have some fairly successful home runs and, uh, it's been a 30 year career that I have loved. Sure, no, that, that's quite fascinating to me. So uh, basically um, you put together something that I think is very, very cool in, in the Dream Toolbox. So why did you decide to create it and what exactly is the Dream Toolbox? Well, the Dream Toolbox is designed as a series of very short, I'll call them blogs for lack of a better word. Okay. Um, uh, we call them episodes on the site, which are a three to four minute uh, explication of some aspect of entrepreneurship. We're focused uh, not so much on the nuts and bolts of how do you form a company and how do you write a business plan as on, on the more fundamental change in mental attitudes. I, I call it aspirational rather than inspiration. Interesting. Uh, so how do, you, how do you decide to become an entrepreneur? How do you change the way you think to become an entrepreneur? The reason behind it was I had been enormously helped by uh, various people early in my career. And uh, 
decided I need to pay this forward uh, because there are hundreds, if not well, hundreds of thousands of young people who don't have the advantage I had of having a mentor at a critical period in their life. And maybe I can achieve that for some small segment of them. So that was the origin of Dream Toolbox and what we're really about in trying to do it now. Sure. No, I, I think that's really great. But you've also done a lot of work with kind of the youth. Do you want to talk about that as well? Yes, I will. Uh, the, the interesting thing is there is I've volunteered now for, oh, I don't know how many years, quite a few, uh, in entrepreneurial classes within inner city public schools and sure. charter schools as well. Uh, and what I found there was, was a couple of interesting things. Uh, one, if you take a class of, let's say, 30 kids, and I spend an hour a week with them, uh, if at the end of the semester, one or two of them have the light go off in their eyes and they say, wow, there is something more to life than just being a clerk at Walmart or sure. whatever job and hoping for a retirement, I could really do something that I never dreamed I could do. That's the good news. The bad news is that's maybe one out of 30 or two out of 30 if we're really lucky. And there are only so many hours in a day and so much time that I could do that. So I thought, you know, maybe there's a better way. The other thing that triggered it was I was uh, on more than one occasion, I was a guest panelist on programs for, for inner city youth run by somebody else. And I was maybe on the stage for 10 or 15 minutes. Okay. More than once, somebody has come up to me afterward and said, you said something there that changed my whole outlook. And I know that at least one of these people went on to form, a, form a, an entrepreneurial company and is in the middle of trying to do fundraising now and others have done other things. So I said, you know, it doesn't require necessarily uh, me spending an hour a day uh, once a week or, or more to reach these kids. It can be as simple as a 15 second sound bite almost that I don't intend as a sound bite. Sure. So maybe if I put together something that will reach hundreds of thousands of kids and I can still get the same one or 2% who get the response or who generate the response, then I'm doing way more than I could ever do by volunteering in classrooms. I still volunteer because I like it and I like the human interaction, but I'm trying to do something a little bigger and hope that uh, not only can I reach kids, but can I reach parents, guidance counselors, teachers, other people who will say to their students, you know, there's this dream toolbox thing you should go listen to. It might change your life. So that's my hope is that I can have a two pronged approach reaching both adults and the young people that they might be mentors to. That, that's really great. And you have tons of episodes that people can kind of go check out online for free. But there's a few that I really want to kind of talk about because you have an, an entire episode kind of about kind of render or sorry, race and gender um, that do you maybe want to talk about that? Because I think that's come some of the most powerful stuff, I think, in, in the episodes. Well, I'm happy to. It's, it's one that uh, sometimes gets me in trouble because uh, People don't always agree with me, but I've been involved. I've started 10 companies. Uh, I've probably invested in another 50. So wow. I have seen a lot of people come and go as entrepreneurs and so on from all kinds of uh, ethnic and racial minorities and, and uh, gender minorities, if, if you can assume that women are a minority. I think they outnumber us, but uh, in terms <laughs> of the business place, they sure. still suffer from that. And what I've concluded is that in the long run, race, gender doesn't matter. It doesn't mean it's not harder and more difficult for people who are from a minority to get ahead and to reach the top. But what also happens is something else. And that is those who recognize that this is both a liability, but potentially an opportunity and who don't get caught up in the the guilt game or the blame game, uh, and so they don't give up on themselves, often do remarkably well. I mean, I think people don't know, for example, that the uh, uh, chairman of the board of uh, American Express, which is about as lily white a 
<laughs> financial organizations sure. you could have uh, for many years has been black and a very successful, very impressive uh, executive. And those stories are throughout industry, many in smaller startups. Sure. Uh, what happens is, and I, I had this illustrated to me a number of times, but one in particular, if I can take just a moment. Sure, more. of course. I had the president of a startup company that came to me for financing and we financed him. Okay. And he was black. And I went on a road trip with him to try to raise additional money. And I noticed that he always carried with him a little travel iron. He was always the most impeccably dressed of any of us. And I said, you know, why is that? And he said, well, he said, I'm aware that, no kidding, I'm black. And I don't want to give anybody an excuse to say no to my ideas based on their prejudices or their skin color. And the best way I can combat that is to always be the best dressed person in the room and if possible, the most articulate person in the room, using the best English, the best grammar, all of those things. Well, he had done that. He had done that very well. And he had trained himself and uh, he was president of a company. We financed it. So, uh, <laughs> and that's just one of many examples, but I've seen it over and over again. And I've also seen people from minorities, uh, women and, and otherwise, uh, who say, well, I just can't make it because I'm black or I'm Hispanic or I'm a woman. Uh, and sure enough, they can't. And it goes back to that old Henry Ford quotation, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Yeah. So I'm a huge believer that uh, race matters in that it, it can set the bar a little higher. But once you get over that bar, it's, it becomes a plus, not a minus. Sure. No, I, I, I think that's, that's actually like really good advice to people out there, right? That, yeah, like it can be harder, like you mentioned, but like you should, that you shouldn't let that kind of stop you. Right. And I think, um, you know, I think that's really good advice, but you touch on something throughout the course as well that I, I think is worth mentioning. Well, a couple of things. Um, the first one is kind of around kind of actually creating your dream and actually kind of, you know, actually visualizing it. Do you want to kind of maybe elaborate on some of that stuff? Sure, I'd be happy to. You know, there, there is a very old saying, if, if you don't have a dream, how are you going to have a dream come true? Sure. But what I do find among entrepreneurs is often a very fuzzy concept of where they want to go. And um, so one of the drills that I use when I'm working with young people, and, and others for that matter, is a very simple one, and I recommend it to, to everyone, and that's to take out a piece of paper and set aside a few minutes and writing very rapidly, write down everything that you think you would love to do if you knew you couldn't fail. Interesting. And that's, that's a critical part, the if you knew you couldn't fail, because your mind will tell you all the reasons why you can't. So you can't let your mind or your subconscious edit You've got to just write it all out. You'll get a list. Some of it will be kind of nonsensical, <laughs> but you have to be careful throwing out the nonsensical ones. Uh, you know, I often say if, if uh, Wilbur and Orville Wright had written the list and said, oh, that's ridiculous, man can't fly, uh, we'd still be getting across the country a rather slow way. Sure. <laughs> so, but it's very, very interesting to see what comes out of those lists. I still do it for myself periodically just to see – what else pops up? And uh, I'm often amazed. No, I, I think that's, that's really good advice. So the other thing I really want to kind of get your thoughts on is, and, and I don't think it's true, but I, I think just getting somebody like yourself to talk about it is so many people when they're thinking about actually starting a business or, or doing something or chasing some sort of dream, they, ex they think that they need to make this like billion dollar idea. Like, there's nothing wrong with making an extra twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year as a part-time thing, or or maybe a full-time thing, or a hundred thousand dollars, or a million dollar. Like you don't need to always build these like billion-dollar businesses to live a happy life. Is is that kind of what you've experienced as well? Well, I think so. I w I would almost modify that a little bit. Sure. Ago. Twenty years or so ago, a guy wrote a book called The Millionaire Next Door. Sure, I read that. It's like great. That. And basically, he studied lives of ordinary people whom you would never expect to be rich, 
who were all millionaires. And that sure. was in a day when a million dollars really meant something. <laughs> sure, sure. But the principle is the same. Maybe it's 10 million today, but w whatever it is. And no, you don't have to build the next Google or the next Apple or the next uh, Facebook or whatever. But what I think is important is for people to make sure that their idea is big enough to be a challenge Interesting. and big enough. I think ideally big enough that you can turn it into a business, which can someday support you. Uh, I'm, I'm never a terribly big fan of what I call lifestyle businesses, okay. which is you're working for yourself, but you're your own worst boss because you work 80 hour weeks and you don't ever accumulate anything. I think it's much more important to develop skills and to develop a business which ultimately can either run by itself or with hired people while you sit on the Riviera or can be <laughs> sold to uh, some big company for a, a, a few hundred million dollars so that you can go sit on the Riviera, whatever it is. Doesn't mean you need to do that. But ultimately, you're building assets. And a job uh, or even a business that you run is only as good as your next paycheck or your next physical checkup. But sure. if you've built an asset base, none of those things can, can affect you. I, I had a very personal example that I don't have in Dream Toolbox. Uh, two or three years ago, I had what was thought to be a life-threatening illness. And I was, uh, fortunately, it wasn't. And I'm perfectly healthy now. But I was completely out of business for about 18 months. Wow. Well, if I had not built an asset base, that would have been a disastrous 18 months. Sure. As it was, it was a big annoyance because I wanted to be doing stuff that I couldn't do. But I'm a great believer of trying to take your skills, build a business, even within a job, build skills that if that company goes out of business tomorrow, as two of mine did, um, not the ones I founded, but ones I worked for, you can still go forward and not miss a beat. So I, I think that's the important part of that. Sure. I, I think the other thing too, that people forget about a lot of the times, and maybe it sounds kind of stupid to say, but if you eventually go start your own business and it fails for whatever reason, you can always either go start a new business or you can go back into the workforce. Like it's not this end of the world type thing. As long as you kind of keep your skills current and relevant, is that kind of fair to say? Oh, it's a hundred percent fair to say if, because again, it's all about skills. You can lose a job, you can have a business fail. Mm -hmm. So what? I've had them happen to me. Um, in terms of businesses I've invested in, I probably have enough worth of stock certificates to paper a bathroom. <laughs> uh, fortunately, the ones I started myself, I, I've been a little better track record and I've done quite well. But yeah, I, I talk about fear of failure. And what I've concluded is that Failure, particularly in the United States, you can fail multiple times. Most entrepreneurs have, sure. uh, even some of the very big ones that you've heard about. But what I think causes more problems is the fear of failure that keeps you from ever starting or keeps you from taking a calculated risk. And that is more often than not, not a fear of the real failure, but a fear of, oh, what will my friends say? Will they laugh at me? What's going to be the fallout in personal terms. And you have to face that because it's, it's destructive. One of the drills that I use that I found is very, very helpful is when I'm looking at a new project and it feels a little risky, I sit down and I say, oh, and I make a list sometimes or do it mentally. What is the worst thing that could happen if I try this and it fails? And the answer almost always is, well, I'll lose some money and I'll have to start over. So what? Sure. Uh, and, but once you've faced what the worst is and you know that you can survive it, then the fear of failure pretty much goes away. And if it's there at all, it's really a fear of embarrassment. We can all get over that. Sure. No, that's, that's really good advice. So you also have a chapter or an episode, I should say, about kind of freedom and happiness. Do you maybe want to talk about some of those things? Because I think, as you know, the entrepreneurial journey can have tons of kind of highs and lows, even sometimes multiple of those in one day. So do you maybe want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I will. I, I'm not quite sure where to start on that one. <laughs> one thing that, uh, that I hear all the time is, 
well, you know, why do you want to put in all that effort to be an, an entrepreneur? Money can't buy happiness, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or the, the worst version is, you know, money is the root of all evil, which is sure. a, a misquote, by the way. The real quote is the love of money is the root of evil, sure. which is very different. But the truth is um, we're going to be happy or unhappy depending on what we view our li- how we view our lives and what we've done. And nothing contributes more to happiness than a feeling of having put forth your best effort and succeeded, or at least know that you've done the very best you could. Now, in entrepreneurial endeavors, that usually means you've made some money. And if you have, quite frankly, I've been poor and happy and I've been rich and happy, but being rich and happy is a lot more fun. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. Yeah. Uh, And, uh, but Money won't buy you happiness, and, and there's no question about that. But it what, sure helps smooth the path. What about does money buy freedom? Seems to. Um, in a very real sense, it does. Um, if you have, and, and it does it, in money and skills buy freedom. Uh, a, a job is a terribly vulnerable thing. You can be fired tomorrow. Sure. But if you have skills, You can always translate those into money. And then if you use the money and the skills to build working assets over a period of time, and it may be a year, it may be 20 years, um, then you have the freedom to know that really there's nothing in the external world short of war, I suppose, or or natural catastrophe that's going to keep you from being able to conduct your lifestyle. Uh, I woke up quite a few years ago, uh, one New Year's Day, and I said, you know, I just realized I don't ever have to work again a day in my life. Now, I've worked for 20 years or more since then because I love it. (laughs) But that's freedom to know, or it's at least financial freedom. I mean, you know, freedom is a different matter in the United States than it is in Kosovo or someplace. But economic freedom is something that we can all create and all enjoy. And life is tough without it. If you're worried about, can you put food on the table for your kids? Can you pay the mortgage? You're not really free to make your best decisions. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. And, and I think we're, we're kind of coming to the end, but I really want to maybe close the show with, is there any other kind of advice that you'd kind of give people to maybe just get started that are still kind of on the fence about it. And I'm not saying they need to quit their job. Maybe they just start kind of part-time in the evenings or on weekends, but is there any kind of final advice you'd like to give to people out there? Yeah, I can do it in two words. Perfect. Just start. (laughs) I see more dreams founder because a lot of planning went on and everybody did all of these things, but they never really said, okay, Now I'm going to do it. And you don't necessarily have to quit your job. Eventually, if you're successful, you will have to. But that's a happy problem. Uh, But there's an enormous amount that you can do without quitting your day job, if you will. And and we live in an era in the United States now, the so-called gig economy, where you you can work during the day and you can drive to build extra money with Uber or whatever you want to do. Or you can start writing the code for your next startup or developing uh, the next product, whatever it is. So yeah, just start. I think that's really good advice, Ken. So let's close the show with mentioning where people can get more information about uh, you and uh, Dream Toolbox. The best place is just uh, www.dreamtoolbox.com. Perfect, Ken. As always, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, man. Okay, bye.